It's a great pleasure to welcome Dimitra Caraballi, who is going to tell us today uh, about aspects of the higher dimensional quantum Hall effect. And she's visiting us virtually from New York. Thanks, Dimitra, for joining us. We okay, appreciate thank it. you. Thank you for inviting me uh, to give the talk. So um, I think I'll give a kind of a reviewist talk on uh, the work that Paramesura, Nair, and I have been doing on and off for several years now um, on higher dimensional quantum Hall effect, and in particular quantum Hall effect on complex projective spaces. I will focus on two topics, the effective actions, which is an older work, and some more recent work on entanglement entropy. Um, and this uh, kind of topic has uh, some kind of a renewed interest because there are apparently uh, several groups that they have managed to simulate four-dimensional quantum Hall effect on the lab using synthetic dimensions. And I will talk a little bit about that later. Uh, so in that sense, we hope that our work um, acts like a bridge between theory and experiment. Um, okay, so, so what I will do, I will start with the very basic features of the two-dimensional, the original two-dimensional quantum Hall effect, and then I'll see how these features extend to higher dimensions. So one uh, deals with planar non-relativistic electrons in a strong perpendicular magnetic field, and the um, the main uh, feature of the, of the effect is the quantization of Hall conductivity uh, given in this relation. Um, this is the external uh, perpendicular uh, uh, electric field along the sample. This is a current perpendicular to that. And this sigma is the Hall conductivity, which is in units of E square over A, it is quantized. And nu is the fill-in fraction, which is integer for integer quantum Hall effect and takes particular fractional values for the fractional quantum Hall effect. Uh, now, um, it has provided a framework for interesting ideas such as topological field theories. Um, I will show you the effective actions uh, being essentially topological field theories, St. Simon's actions. Uh, there is a relation, interesting relation between the bulk and edge dynamics and also place um, there are features of non-commutative uh, geometries and fuzzy spaces that come in and uh, you'll see later. Okay, so let me start with um, the single particle spectrum. One has a charged particle moving on a two-dimensional plane or a sphere in a strong uh, external magnetic field. So one has to solve the Landau problem. And uh, we find that there are distinct Landau levels um, separated by an energy gap, which is proportional to B. So there is a big energy gaps. Each of these Landau levels is degenerate in energy. And the lowest Landau level, um, the wave functions of the lowest Landau level at a particular gauge are holomorphic functions up to this um, exponential. Um, so the many body problem gives rise to quantum hole droplets. Um, sorry, may I interrupt? Yes, um, please. I got a little bit confused on the previous slide. Uh, you mentioned that the different levels have uh, are separated by an energy gap. Uh, but then uh, you mentioned that they're degenerating energy. Each, 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 each Landau level is uh, degenerating energy, but between two consecutive Landau levels, there is an energy gap. So I we see. have the first Landau level, the second Landau level, and so on. Yeah. Uh -huh. so, okay. so each Landau level is degenerating energy with... Uh, Oh, yes, yeah, so there are many, many states at each Landau level. Uh -huh. All the all states on one level. Yeah, energy. Energy. Okay, okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, so the many body problem gives rise to the so called quantum hole droplets. So, what happens is if now we introduce a confining potential, then the degeneracy of each Landau level is lifted. And in practice, this confining potential can be the actual can be brought by the actual uh, boundary of the sample. Uh, now, the electrons in that case try to confine um, around the minimum of the potential, but there are electrons, so there is an exclusion principle. 
Uh, so they spread out and they form incompressible droplets. And because of the incompressibility, the dynamics is only on the boundary of the droplet. Uh, so this, the low energy excitations of the droplets um, correspond to these area preserving boundary fluctuations, which are called the edge excitations. And the dynamics of the edge excitations is collectively described by one dimensional chiral boson given by this action. Okay, this was done many years ago. Uh, so the edge dynamics is described by one dimensional chiral boson. Uh, now, uh, if we introduce uh, electromagnetic fluctuations in addition to the constant magnetic field, uh, then there we also have bulk dynamics. So, uh, and the bulk dynamics it is, is described by a Chern Simons effective action. One can find that by integrating out the fermions. And this coefficient here is proportional to the, is essentially the whole conductivity. Uh, there is also the edge dynamics, which is now a gauged chiral action. Uh, each one of them is not gauge invariant, but of course the anomaly cancellation, there is an anomaly cancellation between the bulk and edge dynamics as expected. And further, the, the bulk effective action uh, captures the response of the system to electromagnetic fluctuations, because if we take this action and we vary with respect to A, we find the current. And from this formula here, we can read out what the whole conductivity is. Okay. So, sorry. Uh, yes. At the, the bottom of your screen is that visible, is covered by something else. Uh, how do I move? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Okay, thanks. Uh, okay, okay. I thought I only see that, and because I know what I'm going to say, I didn't bother. But... Okay, okay. So, uh, so, the, so we we have the effective action. We vary with respect to a mu. We find the current, and this is exactly the and the coefficient here is the whole conductivity. Okay, uh, but what about other transport coefficients? For example, how does the system respond to strain, to stress and strain? So for that, we have to find, to calculate the uh, stress tensor, and we have to couple the theory to gravity. And in fact, uh, that's what was done uh, years ago by Abanov and Gromov. They took the non-relativistic system, they coupled to gravity, they integrated out the fermions, and we, they found an effective action of this form now. It's a kind of a Chen simons type, but besides be, uh, the ADA term, there are extra terms. This omega is the spin connection, and the S is an index that characterizes the Landau level. So S equals zero corresponds to the lowest Landau level, S equals one to the first Landau level, and so on. And the, um, the, the variation of effective action with respect to omega zero now gives rise to a new transport transport coefficient, which is the whole viscosity. And this kind of effective action was also re-derived uh, using different methods by other groups. Okay, so, um, so now what I want to uh, show you is how these two-dimensional features extend to higher dimensions. Okay, so how do we construct effective actions? Where does the omega come from? Uh, the omega is essentially uh, comes, so what they do is, uh, even in the flat, in flat space, they introduce a kind of a deformed metric where the, each point x changes to x plus something. So they have a deformed metric and omega is related to the time dependence of that deformation. Okay, so that essentially introduces some kind of stress and strain into the system. Okay. Even in the even in flat space. Um, okay, so uh, um, okay, so let's see how this extends to higher dimensions. Um, so the first attempt to extend quantum Hall effect in higher dimensions was done by Hu and Zhang, who um, try to formulate quantum Hall effect on S4 by using an SU2 uh, magnetic field. And uh, shortly after that, uh, with Paramesuran, we uh, generalized this 
to arbitrary even dimensions, special dimensions, by formulating quantum Hall effect on the complex projective spaces. These are 2K dimensional manifolds, and the formulation on this uh, introduces two new features. First, higher dimensionality, because, and that gives now a uniform approach on how to do it in all higher dimensions. But second, it also introduces the possibility of having both abelian and non-abelian magnetic fields. In the case of the non-abelian magnetic fields, the corresponding electrons, let's say, they have internal degrees of freedom. Um, okay, since, so I'll show you the details of that. So since then, of course, uh, many other groups uh, generalize this to other kinds of manifolds, but I will only uh, talk, uh, talk about the complex projective spaces here. Okay, so let me say a few more things about the spaces. As I said, there are two k-dimensional spaces and they're locally parameterized by complex coordinates Z. So the metric in these spaces is the usual Fubini study, uh, study metric, which is given by this uh, expression. And from there, one can also read the Keller to form by uh, replacing the dots with wedges. Now, an important feature for, of these models is the fact that they can thought of as uh, the manifolds, they can thought as group cosets so CPK is SUK plus one mod UK. And this is very important in um, when we derive the single particle spectrum. So the group theory analysis that comes from the structure uh, makes it relatively easy to find the single par uh, particle spectrum and analyze the Landau levels. Okay, some general features because of this UK we can have both a U1 and a SUK background magnetic fields. The Landau wave functions are functions on SUK plus one with particular transformation properties under UK. Uh, as I said before, there are distinct degenerate Landau levels. We see the same feature here. Uh, and consecutive Landau levels are separated by energy gap. And each Landau level forms an irreducible representation of SUK plus one, whose degeneracy and energy is relatively easy to calculate. So let me go uh, briefly over some of the features of the single particle spectrum. I'm sorry if I may jump in again. Uh, so of, I'm a little bit course. slow. So the Landau levels, um, they are. So they are degenerate in energy, and what is uh, the property that uh, distinguishes between them? Is it the internal degrees of freedom? Uh, no, the fact that there. So in this particular case, each Landau level is yeah. uh, forms a particular representation of SQK plus one, and they're yeah. degenerate. The degeneracy is the main feature of the Landau, uh, the, the Landau, each Landau level. So there are groups of single particle spectrums arranged into Landau levels. Each Landau level is degenerate in energy. Yes, but uh, so you also say that they are distinct. Uh, I mean, do you mean that the levels are distinct from each other or the- Yes, the, the levels are on... distinct from each other. Oh, I see. I thought you were saying that the states on the each Landau level are uh, distinct from each other. Well, the states are distinct also. There are- uh, each one, each Landau level has, a, let's say, number n of states there. Okay. That degeneracy is fixed group theoretically, and I will yeah. come into that. And consecutive Landau levels have this energy gap. Yeah. So those n states, the magnetic field, the n states on the same Landau level, how are they uh, distinguished from each other? Well, by the group, it's it's very much like an uh, an atom. Venus, you have uh, energy oh, levels in an atom, and uh, you can have the P and the SPD yeah. could yeah. all be uh, degenerate. Yeah, 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 yeah. But uh, and they're de they're determined by group theory. Mm -hmm. Yeah, just that. I mean, I, I I thought there is some internal degree of freedom that distinguishes. Well, so you can think of the degree other. of freedom as the hypercharge of this SUK plus one. They, they are in a multiplet of a group multiplet of SUK plus yeah. one. 
so like the angular momentum yeah. degrees of freedom of the SUK plus one, let's say. Mm -hmm. Okay. But perhaps it would be clear just to say that they're linear independent rather than to say they're distinct because there's no physical characteristic yeah. that distinguishes between them. Thank you. Yeah, that yeah, that clarifies it. Yeah. Okay, maybe that, that would be better. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, let me briefly go over this uh, a little bit. So how we uh, uh, find these uh, uh, levels. So uh, because CPK is written like that, is SUK plus one mod UK, uh, we can use as, the, um, as a coordinate in this manifold, the matrix G, K plus one by K plus one matrix G. And in order to make a connection with the complex coordinates, uh, what happens is that the column of this matrix can be written in terms of these complex coordinates, Z. Now, um, translations in that group manifold correspond to right transformations. Z goes to G, G prime. However, because this is modded with uh, UK, the points G and GH, where H is in UK, are identified. So if we define the right translation operators to do the right rotations, then because of this relation here, the UK right transformations correspond to gauge transformations. Uh, and the rest of them, the cosset ones, combined in complex, in complex combinations uh, correspond to covariant derivatives in this space. So the wave functions are written in terms of the Wigner D functions, where this G is some arbitrary element in SUK plus one, and this alpha and L are states within that particular J representation. Now, these states alpha have particular uh, charges under UK, but what charges they are assigned to that depend on the choice of the background fields. So, as I said, uh, we can choose either a U1 background magnetic field, but because in C CPK, we can have also the possibility of having a UK background magnetic field. Now, the U1 field can be written like this in terms of Gs, and as a result, the corresponding field strength is essentially the Keller 2 form of this manifold with a coefficient 10 where n determines the degeneracy of the Landau level. And this is exactly what happens for quantum Hall effect on the sphere on S2, because after all, S2 is the smallest complex projective manifold, CP1. However, as I said before, we can also have SUK background magnetic fields. Uh, these are written in terms of G like that. And the corresponding field strengths are proportional to the components of the curvature of the space. And in the basis of um, the tangent frames, uh, these coefficients here are nothing but the SUK structure constants. So in that sense, these are constant background magnetic fields. OK, uh, now these states alpha uh, have to have so let's say that we have only a U1 magnetic field because this changes under uh, U1 rotations of G, then alpha have to have a particular U1 charges and up to some normalization, these are their U1 charges. Now, if we, we also have an SUK background magnetic field, then this alpha have to uh, uh, correspond to a particular uh, SUK right representation. So uh, in summary, the wave functions for each Landau level, they form an SUK plus one representation J, such that these states, the right states, have a particular U1 charge, which is proportional to N, and they belong to some finite SUK representation, which we call J tilde, okay? These L's count the degeneracy within the Landau level, and it goes from one to the dimension of the SUK plus one representation. And these alphas 
goes from 1 to n prime, which is the dimension of the SUK representation, and they form it's play the role of some kind of internal index. Okay, now we can come to the Hamiltonian of the theory. So the Hamiltonian uh, is written in terms of these covariant derivatives. And one can show that the, it, it has this form where these are the quadratic azimuths of the, the representations. So you see why they are degenerate. Because if you fix J and J tilde, all these states have the same energy. Now, the lowest Landau level satisfies R minus on psi zero, which is the analog of the holomorphicity condition. The fact, remember that on the plane, the functions are holomorphic, the lowest Landau uh, level wave functions are holomorphic functions. And in that case, this state alpha is the lowest weight state, which determines the full representation. Um, for example, uh, if we have a U1 magnetic field, then the lowest Landau level wave functions can be written in terms of complex coordinates like that. These form an SUK plus one representation of this dimension, and they're degenerate with this energy. So, however, we can also construct wave functions, non abelian wave functions. Okay, so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to leave aside the complexities of the one dimension, the single particle spectrum. And I want to um, determine a little bit the dynamics of this uh, um, ed, uh, ed, um, chiral droplets that I mentioned before more generally. So suppose we have a quantum Hall effect on a compact space M, and let's say that the Lois Landau level defines an n-dimensional Hilbert space. Um, so as I mentioned before, in the presence of a confining potential, we have this incompressible quantum Hall droplets. And let's say that n, a k out of the n are occupied. So if I write this density matrix here, I start from the lower state and I start filling them up. So k of these are uh, filled, and the rest, the n minus k, are unoccupied. Now, the most general transformation that preserves the, um, the, the number of occupied states is uh, u, uh, unitary transformations, un transformations. So as a result, under time evolution, this rho zero goes to rho where which is this, where U is an n by n unitary matrix. So in the sense, uh, this unitary matrix uh, U uh, serves as a collective variable describing the, excit the excitations within that lowest Landau level. Now, uh, we, we can write down an action for this U, and this action takes this form where V is the confining potential which leads to the evolution equation for the met density matrix as expected. So in that sense, this is a universal matrix action, which has no explicit dependence on the properties of the space on which the quantum Hall effect is defined, whether uh, we have a billion or non-abelian uh, magnetic fields or, or anything like that. However, we can bring in the features of the space-time features of the quantum Hall effect um, by using the same technique that we do in non-commutative field theory in the following sense. So uh, this is the matrix action, and we go from the matrix action to a non-commutative field theory uh, by replacing the matrices by the corresponding symbols. What I mean by that, a symbol is uh, essentially the matrix, a symbol O is the matrix O sandwiched with a single particle spectrum. These are the single particle wave functions, psi and psi star. So I go from an operator to a classical function. Further, if I take the symbol of a product of matrices, uh, that is the star product of the two symbols. And the trace, the matrix trace, is replaced by uh, integration over the, the measure on the space that the quantum Hall effect is defined. 
Okay, so that universal matrix action is now equal to the uh, to a non-commutative uh, bosonic field theory in terms of use and the star products. Okay, so now I claim that this action is the exact bosonic action which describes the dynamics of the Lois Landau level fermions. And this is something that was used by Sakita a long time ago in a two-dimensional context, and also by the group of uh, Das and Dar, Mandal and Wadia when they were talking about the C1 uh, string theory. So this is a way essentially to um, integrate out fermions in circumvent that, so you can uh, write down a, a, an effective field theory by integrating the original fermions. That's exactly what is done here. Okay, uh, so now I want to take an extra um, limit, the limit where I, I take n to infinity. So I want to take a large number the dimension of that Hilbert space is large, so the number of occupied states is also large. So what happens is that this theory here, this uh, non-commutative field theory here, essentially reduces to a chiral edge action, and this is what I want to mention now. Sorry, uh, Dimitri, can you can you remind me why was it first order in time again? I missed some. Uh... How were, you how were you guaranteed that the action you wanted to consider was first order in time? The action maybe, is maybe what? I can maybe uh, this previous trans slide. I, I'm sorry, I didn't write here. Yes, mm -hmm. is that the one you are looking? Yeah, at? You, you're okay. So I'm saying, suppose I start with a particular, I have a confining potential, I start with some droplet. Yes. What are the possible excitations of that, that preserve the lowest Landau level condition? Yes, some I can see that you've got a unitary matrix that you can rotate. Some arbitrary unit, unitary transformation. So now, so U is like a collective variable, and I want to write an action for that U. Okay, so what is the action? I'm saying this is the action that will give me the evolution equation for the density mat matrix. So I start with this action. This is a matrix action, but I can always write it in terms of a non-commutative field theory yes. by taking okay. star products with respect to the single particle spectrum of the manifold I have, and that is the CPK manifold. So once I do that, then the possible excitations on the lowest Landau level are given in terms of this uh, non-commutative field theory. But now I want to take the large n limit and see what is that effective field theory. So what I'm saying is now that if I take the large n limit, this theory becomes an edge action, okay, which is defined on the edge of that droplet. And I want to show you how it works for a Yuan field, uh, the final result, of course. And then I want to show you how uh, it, what it looks like when I have a, 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 nice, a non abelian magnetic field. Okay, so in the case of a magnetic field, the boson field U is written as e to the i phi. And there are two important ingredients. ingredients. The first ingredient is that the symbol of a commutator reduces at the large end limit to a Poisson bracket, okay, where omega is the symplectic structure of CPK. And further, the density matrix, the symbol for the density matrix, becomes essentially a step function, where it's constant inside the droplet and zero is outside the droplet. Okay, with these two ingredients, what happens is that the effective action becomes an edge effective action of this form. Now, so this uh, L phi, this is a derivative along a, tan a tangential direction on the droplet. Now, if that was one dimensional case, then of course, for one dimensional, uh, for a, a two dimensional droplet, the boundary 
is one dimensional. So there is a single tangential derivative. However, if I have a higher dimensional droplet, then there are many tangential derivatives on the boundary. But what happens, and that's interesting in this uh, type of theories, the, the, the propagation is along a particular direction, a particular tangential direction, which is chosen by the theory. And that is a Poisson bracket to the radial direction on the droplet, okay? So essentially, although this is a higher dimensional theory, uh, locally it's like a collection of one dimensional chiral fields with a multiplicity, and the multiplicity is given by the dimension of the transverse dimensions, uh, transverse space, okay? So it's higher dimensional, however, it's a collection of one dimensional chiral fields because the propagation is along a particular direction on the boundary, and that's important. Okay, so let's see how it works when we have a non-abelian background field. Uh, in that case, as I said, the wave function is a non-trivial representation of SUK. So now the symbol is not just a, a, a function, is a matrix valued function, an n prime by n prime matrix valued function. And in that case, the action can be written in terms of u n prime. And this is a kind of a generalized uh, gauged Vesumino action. So let's cover that. Now, if you neglect this term, this looks like a usual uh, two dimensional uh, gauged Vesumino action, but because the space, the manifold is higher dimensional, you need the extra powers of this scalar form to saturate the integrand. Uh, this uh, is a derivative, but now it's a covariant derivative along the boundary of the droplet. But again, as before, the, the, the direction is a particular, the propagation is along a particular tangential direction on the manifold. So this, again, can be thought of as a collection of two-dimensional um, gates Vesumino actions. Okay? And this is uh, vectorally gates, so the, of course there is no anomaly. Okay? So these are the effective actions of the edge dynamics when the magnetic field, the background magnetic field is fixed for a fixed background field. Are there any questions? Sorry, can I ask Mitra? Um, the, the, the manifold D, uh, I'm a bit confused. Is the manifold, the manifold D is odd dimensional? Okay, yeah. so so the, the boundary of the D, uh, yes, yeah, so, so I have included, in time is included here also. It's time, I see, okay, thank you, yeah. Yes. Okay. Okay, so uh, the next question is now what happens if one fluctuates these uh, magnetic fields, the background magnetic fields? Okay, how do we introduce that? So this is only edge dynamics, but we know that once we fluctuate the background field, there should be bulk dynamics too. So how do we uh, construct that? Okay, so the idea is at the matrix level, what we do is, um, in order to introduce the gauge fluctuations, we gauge the matrix action. So instead of the time derivative, we have a covariant time derivative. So now the, at the matrix level, this is the action we have, and this is the extra ingredient here. Very similarly, we can have star products, introduce star products with a single particle spectrum. So we write down a non-commutative um, action like this. But the question is, how is script A related to the gauge fields, which are coupled to the original fermions? Okay, so this action here is invariant under the following transformations. So it's invariant under these transformations. But we know that the action that we started has to describe the gauge interactions and it has to be invariant under the usual gauge transformations. 
So the recipe then is to choose the script A as a function of these gates of the gates fields, so that if we do the gates transformation on the right hand side, this will induce the appropriate transformation on the left hand side for script A. Okay. So this is essentially um, a generalized cyber grid and map, but now um, applied to a manifold, a, a cared manifold with non-abelian gauge fields. Okay. So once we find this kind of uh, correspondence between script A and A, uh, we take the uh, script A expression in terms of the gauge fields, we put it into the action, and we have the the corresponding effective action. And now further, we have to take the large end limit. Okay, so when we do all these things, what we find at the end is that the action splits into two parts. One that gives the edge action, it's an edge effective action, and the other part is the bulk action. Now it turns out that the edge action is essentially a chirally gates vesumino action in 2k dimensions and the bulk action is a, a Chern simons action now each one of them is not gauge invariant because the chirally gates one has anomalies this is not gauge invariant because there is a boundary but however the gauge invariance is automatically built into the theory so we know that the two things together they will be if we put them together there will be anomaly cancellation as the total action will be gauge invariant. Okay, so this is how we construct effective actions. But, uh, but recall that the whole construction depends very much on a star product idea. So that means that one needs to know the single particle spectrum because that's how we construct the star, star products. But what if we want to introduce uh, fluctuations uh, uh, in the metric of this space, because after all, we want to identify things that define the analogs of the whole viscosity in these higher dimensional spaces. Once we deviate from the CPK manifold, we don't know the single spectrum anymore. So I cannot use uh, follow this prescription to find the effective actions. So now I want to mention another um, way to calculate the effective actions that include both gates and metric fluctuations. Okay. And that is by using a particular index. Okay, so the lowest Landau level, as I mentioned before, obeys this holomorphicity condition. And we know that for complex manifolds, the number of normalizable solutions to this is given by the so-called Dolbo index. Uh, I won't go into the details. I only want to say that the, the integrand here, this is the Toda class, which are traces of powers of the curvature. And this is the Chern character, which are traces of powers of the field strengths. Now, what is important in this formula is even if we do small fluctuations around the, ba the background curvature and field strength of these spaces, the index is the same. So we can introduce in this expression small fluctuations on the background fields as long as the index is the same. So here is what uh, we, how we're going to use that. For a fully filled uh, Lois Landau level, the degeneracy of the, of, of the Landau level is automatically equally to Dolbo index because that's how the, this index uh, shows how many uh, normalizable solutions we have to this, which corresponds to the degeneracy. But if we think that each particle carries a unit charge, this is also the charge in that Landau level. So now at the level of densities, therefore, the Dolbo index density would be equal to the charge density of the theory. But the charge density is related to the effective action because if we take the variation of the effective action with respect to A0, that will give me J0, the charge density, 
which now is identified with the Dolbo index density. So what we can do is integrate this expression. So I, I know the Dolbo index density. I integrate with respect to A0. I covariantize, and that's how I find the effective action. Okay, so this is the strategy. I, I don't want to go into all details, but I want to show you what this uh, procedure gives. Okay, so in the case uh, of CP1, which is S2, uh, if we follow that procedure, we find exactly the effective action that was found by Abanov and Gromov and other people by directly integrating out the fermions. Okay. So let me, however, now we have uh, very general results for arbitrary dimensions, higher Landau levels, and non abelian magnetic fields. Okay. So I mean, there are compact formulas that give that, but I'll give you just an explicit one more example uh, in four dimensional case when we have CP2, uh, when lowest Landau level and a billion gauge field. Uh, this is the formula. The omega zero is the U1 part of the spin connection. And the R tilde here is the non abelian part of the curvature because for CP2, I have an abelian part and non abelian part. Okay, so this gives me this expression. So, um, so this gives a way to construct effective actions for all these um, uh, cases, where, as I said, there are fluctuations on both gauge fields and metric fluctuations. So uh, variations with respect to A will give something which is analog to the whole conductivity, Variations with respect to omega zero will give analogs to the whole viscosity. Okay, uh, so this concludes the part of the effective actions. And now I want to move into another topic, which is has to do with entanglement entropy, which is more recent work. Just be before you leave yes. this, supposing I took uh, CP3. Yes. I mean, the CP3 is an S2 bundle over S4. So there's a non trivial metric that I can put on it, which makes the S2 small relative to the S4. Can, I, can you see what would happen in this case here? Well, in my language, CP3 will be SU4 mod U3. Yes, but I, I you could. You, I think you could have introduced your potential so that it was uh, sp2 mod uh, sp1 cross u1 or so5 uh, spin5 mod uh, su2 cross u1, which would have been had less symmetry, taking advantage of the fact that it's an s2 bundle over s4. Okay, so um, you should have been able to defar, put in a potential that uh, that broke it a little bit that way. It, it corresponds to a slightly larger deformation, metric deformation. That's breaking the symmetry, but leaving mo leaving most of the symmetry. Would I get something more interesting here, or is that? I'm not sure. Um, so I can write the effective action for CP three. Um, when I have either a billion gauge field or an SU3 uh, gauge field. Yes. The same way. But what you want to do is instead of having SU3 magnetic field, you want to do, you still. Uh, I, I want to break the symmetry a little bit more because I can break it in an interesting way. Uh, by deforming the metric, you're, you're fluctuating. You're having some metric fluctuation, but there's yes, an interest. The metric for me is um, yes. Yeah, so, so the the curvature is takes value in U three for CP three. So I would yeah, have but, it but I can but I can break I can break that symmetry a little bit and okay, force it I to take. You, I think you could do that, uh, but I, I haven't looked haven't at it. Okay, mm -hmm. okay, all right, thanks. 
Okay, so now, so so now, I would like to um, talk a little bit about some more recent work on entanglement entropy for quantum Hall effect. So, as uh, you, we usually do, uh, we divide the system into two regions: a region D and its uh, complementary, and we define the reduced density matrix by integrating over the complementary region. And GS is the ground state, the many-body ground state. Um, so the entanglement entropy is defined in terms of this reduced density matrix. And for simplicity, I'm going to look at the region D, which is spherically symmetric uh, region of CPK, satisfying this uh, condition, which for CP1, which is a sphere, just to visualize, is essentially a polar cup around the North Pole, uh, bounded by latitude angle theta. And using the stereographic projection, this R is related to this angle theta by, by this formula. Okay, so the entanglement entropy can also be written in terms of these lambdas, where uh, lambdas are the eigenvalues of the two-point correlator, the fermion correlator. And um, it's easy to see that um, the eigenvalues for that are of this form where lambda is the integral of psi star psi within the region D. So uh, for two-dimensional gapped systems, there are uh, there is a general formula. Uh, that the entropy is proportional to the perimeter of the boundary. Uh, C is a non-universal constant, and gamma is some um, universal topological, it's called topological entanglement entropy, but is zero for integer quantum Hall effect. And this is what I want to look at. Um, now for S2, which is CP1, um, this was um, confirmed many years ago by Rodriguez and Sierra, and they found that C is they calculated, uh, they found to be 0.204. And then there are more in general results on Keller manifolds, more recent results, but um, which are based on the U1 magnetic field. But I would like to see how this uh, generalizes to CPK manifolds where we have the possibility of non-abelian magnetic fields. Okay, so as I mentioned before, um, the, the wave function for CPK with a U1 magnetic field, the lois landau level wave functions are, are essentially the coherent states of CPK. Um, this is the dimension of the representation and gives a degeneracy of the lowest Landau level. And the volume of element, the volume element of CPK is this, and we normalize this to one. Okay, with all these ingredients, now we can find what lambda is, which is psi star psi integrated over the region D. And uh, the, the formula for lambda is given by this formula. It's essentially an incomplete beta function. This T0 here uh, is related to the uh, radius of the polar cup. And for each S, there is a degeneracy because um, from this previous S is this. So if I fix S, there are many I's that give me the same S. So there is a particular degeneracy. So the entanglement entropy is given by this degeneracy factor uh, times the um, entropy per mode S, which is given by this formula. Now, it turns out that for large N, this uh, amenable to an analytical semi-classical calculation for all K, which is small than N, okay? And this is the, a uniform approach for all dimensions because K is the dimensional, has to do with the dimensionality of the manifold. Okay, so let me show you how lambda is as a function of S. So for very small uh, S, the, the wave function is localized inside the region D. As a result, lambda is one. For very large S, the wave function is localized outside the region D. So uh, uh, lambda is zero. 
Okay, so in the middle, I have a transition point where lambda is half. And lambda is essentially non zero or one around the boundary of the, uh, uh, the, the, the entangling surface where the wave functions are localized. So if the wave function is localized very near the boundary of the entangling surface, then that's when lambda is non-zero non or non-one deviates from these two values. Okay, uh, further, if I now plot the entropy per mode, because remember the entropy per mode had this uh, expression, if lambda is zero or one, that is zero. Okay, so the age is, has support only around the regions where lambda is non-zero or one, which is essentially the boundary of the entangling surface. Okay, so only wave functions localized around the boundary contribute to this entropy. Now, some features here, if I, we go back to this, uh, the, the graph of lambda, you see that the, the profile is exactly the same, whether k is one or k equals five for any k. So for any dimension of my CPK, these lambdas are the same have the same profile. Now, the, the, the entropy per mode is essentially now, um, okay, so I have a red that is the exact expression, the exact uh, value, and the this dotted thing is Sose Gaussian approximation. So this is a very narrowly picked Gaussian. Uh, so as a result, I can evaluate this by using a steepest descent approximation, an analytical approximation. So uh, what we find is that the entropy uh, takes this form. This is the geometric area of the, um, of the entangling uh, boundary. And this is, so we find that the entropy is proportional to the area times a coefficient that depends on K. And this agrees very well with the result that was found for K equals one by Rodriguez and Sierra. Now, uh, if we express, however, this entropy in terms not of the geometric area, but what I called phase space area, then this, has a universal expression for any k. Okay, so what do I mean by phase space area? Well, uh, the phase space volume essentially is the number of degrees of freedom, so the degeneracy of the lowest Landau level. Um, but this, this um, is the, the measure for the, for the CPK. So from there, I can extract the phase space area, which has this form. And you see that this factor is exactly the factor that appears here. So if I express the entropy in terms of the phase space area, the coefficient in front is independent of K. And this gives me universal formula for any dimension. Okay. And now I would like to see what happens if I have a non-abelian background field. This was for a billion background field. Okay, so if we have a non-abelian magnetic field, uh, as I said before, the wave functions now carry an internal index, alpha, and alpha goes from one to this J dimension of J tilde, which is the SUK representation that the wave functions carry. As a result, there are n prime distinct classes of lambda. Now the calculations are long and tedious because one has to construct the wave functions, normalize them. Anyway, it's, it's a little bit of a mess. However, if one takes the, the large n limit, then what happens is that the entropy is like the abelian entropy multiplied with this dimension j tilde and prime factor. Similarly, the degeneracy of the lowest Landau level at this limit is the degeneracy of the Landau level for the abelian case times this factor. So this factor is carried through also when we define the phase space area. 
So as a result, the formula for the entropy is universal for both abelian and non-abelian background fields and in any dimension, okay, which is nice. Now, this happens for the lowest Landau level. So the question now is, does this extend to higher Landau levels? And the answer is not quite, but it's interesting to see why not. Okay, so are there any questions? Can I just ask a quick question, Dimitra? Um, my, my recollection is, and you've, uh, at the top, you've, you've taken a U1 cross SUK magnetic field. My recollection is that for K equals two, um, I think the second Chern class, if you, if you have no U1 factor, if you just have the SU2, the second Chern class associated with a rank two bundle is actually a fraction, it's three quarters. So the pure SU2 field doesn't really exist in CP2, you need the U1 factor. Does that extend to higher dimensions? Or is it just is yeah, it a fact, U1 is that factor, even dimension, or even K or? Yeah, so U1 factor is very important in that case because the U1 charge essentially is that little n and we have to take n going to infinity for the thermodynamic limit. Uh, if we don't have uh, U1, then the dimension of the SU2 representation has to go to infinity in order to have a large degeneracy for the lowest Landau level. And large N in all this uh, discussion is very important. Okay. Yeah. So no, I it's absolutely... Only, it's only N equals two that you get the three quarters. It's, it's a small N thing. Yeah, yeah okay. so the, I absolutely need the U1 hmm. factor in all this discussion. I can add the SUK background field, but I the U1 field uh, is there. It's like the monopole for the S2 uh, quantum Hall effect. And that is uh, there in all these cases. Thanks. Okay, so let's talk uh, a little bit about the higher Landau levels. And for that, I will restrict to S2 case, to the CP1, to make it easier. So, um, so let's look at the first excited Landau level. Now, the degeneracy of the qth excited level is n plus 2q plus 1, which is for small q and large n. It's more or less the same for all the, the, the uh, Landau levels, the first excited uh, Landau levels. So one can write down the wave function for the first excited level and find the corresponding lambdas. Now, if we plot this lambda as a function of s, the Profile looks more or less the same as before. So for small s, lambda is one because wave functions are localized inside this region D. For large s, uh, lambda is zero. But however, there is a very distinct step-like pattern around this transition point, like a plateau. And one can trace that to the fact that the first excited level wave function has a node. And in fact, one can show generally that the qth excited Landau level, the wave function has Q nodes. So there is this plateau kind uh, of feature. As a result, uh, if one calculates, draws the, uh, um, the entropy per S, then there is a broadening around the transition point. So this is not anymore a sharply picked Gaussian. As a result, the, the analytical semi-classical calculation I did before, which depending on the Gaussian profile, does not work anymore. So I can only calculate numerically that the entropy for the first excited level is some number bigger than one uh, times the entropy of the lowest Landau level. So what is determining the width of that flat region? This has to do with the fact that that at lambda equals half, there is a kind of plateau. So yeah. this plateau here determines that the broadening of the entropy here. I, I understand, but what feature of it is determining how wide that broadening is? Because it has a, it looks like it has some characteristic. Uh, I cannot say limit. that exactly. It, I mean, it presumably, I can... as you uh, as you scale in some way, this gets narrower. Okay, 
I can say that, for example, okay, let me show you something. Go back if I, sorry. So this Gaussian, the width of this Gaussian is controlled, is inversely proportional to the slope of the derivative of lambda here. This yes. is both like square root of n. So this goes like one over square root of n. Yes. Okay. So, so as n goes to in infinity, it's uh, the width is going to zero. Perfect. It goes to zero. Uh, I uh, cannot say exactly how what is the 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 broadening of this. But presumably, it's going with one over square root of n or one some yes. power of n because it's going to zero as. Yes, some part, but I, I I don't have an analytical mm. control. Okay. It it looks like it might be a fraction of uh, of the the width. Could be but, yes, uh, but but I don't have an analytic mm. control of the exact. Although I, I I do have it for the Gaussian, but not for this one. Okay. Okay, so now let's see what happens if I feel both the lowest Landau level and the first excited level that would correspond to nu equals two. What happens in that case? Well, uh, I have the two-point correlator. However, there are overlaps between the, uh, the, the lowest Landau level and the first excited Landau level. So I have to carefully diagonalize the matrix for the, uh, to find the eigenvalues. So what we find at the end are the eigenvalues for this uh, two-point correlator are, are of this form, where lambda zero correspond to the Q equals zero, Landau, the lowest Landau level, lambda one for the first excited Landau level, and this delta lambda here is the overlap between the two. Now, if I plot this lambda tilde, what we find is that that step-like feature disappears. So the lambda tildes are slightly moved away from what the lambda was for nu equals one. As a result, if I calculate the, the entropy per S, what I find is that the entropies are Gaussians picked around these two points and the total entropies, this two mode distribution. So graphically, if I put all the entropies together, the, the per mode, so this is the, the sharply peak Gaussian, this is the broadening, and this is the two mode distribution. And of course, that explains why the entropy for nu equals two is bigger than the entropy for the first excited level, is bigger than the entropy for the lowest Landau level. However, although I can determine this numerically, I do not have a good analytical handle. So I cannot find a, a universal formula that I found for the, the Gaussian case. Okay, so I still think the entropy is proportional to a phase space area, but with a coefficient that I don't uh, have an analytical form for nu equals two and q equals one. Okay, so. Okay, so um, so with that, so now I would like to. Uh, uh, okay, my time is also. I'm sorry, I'm really late. So okay. some comments, a summary, and some comments. So uh, so quantum Hall effect on CPK uh, serves as a platform for quantum Hall effect for arbitrary even dimensions, um, and. Several years ago, this would be a completely theoretical exercise, but as mm -hmm. I said, there are now experimental realizations of four-dimensional quantum Hall effect using synthetic dimensions. And here I put two groups, and there are many authors, and I'm sorry I didn't put all the names. Uh, so there was a proposal by uh, the group of Zilberberg and et al. starting from 2015. Uh, there is a very a new paper that came out. Um, I think there is a French collaboration in 2022. So what happens is the following. So there are many ways to, um, to, to, to use synthetic dimensions, uh, but in, in cold atoms, for example, so they use, so this re, uh, paper uses uh, a lattice of cold atoms. So, but each atom has internal degrees of freedom, their internal states. 
So by using the laser, they simulate um, a transition along these internal states. So essentially, the transition along the internal states can be thought of as propagation along extra dimensions. So for, for in, in this particular paper, for example, the four dimensions, there were two real ones and two synthetic ones using this idea of internal states. And what they found, two important features, first of all, uh, in four dimensions, there is an analog of whole, whole conductivity, like in two dimensions. For us, because we used integer quantum Hall effect, that new equals one for the lowest Landau level. But, but the, that is also related to a certain class of, of a, an electronic band using the um, Berry curvature. So they found that that corresponding CERN class was one first. And the second important feature is uh, this, the, what they call ballistic propaga propagation, which is exactly what I mentioned, that if you look at the edge dynamics of the system, which will be a three-dimensional edge, the propagation is along a particular direction. Okay, which is a very important feature of the edge actions I mentioned earlier. Okay, so in that sense, you know, there is um, some, uh, you know, I think that's, uh, of course, interesting. I'm not sure how far it can go because it's very hard to uh, put kind of, uh, to control the interactions in this extra dimension. So. They can see features of the integer quantum Hall effect, but I'm not sure how it can go. Uh, what would be interesting is to, to kind of deform this kind of cold lattices to see if one can uh, find analogs of the Hall viscosity, something that we can compare with our analysis because we can we can calculate uh, the this uh, the whole the corresponding whole viscosities by varying the action with respect to omega to the spin connection so it will be interesting to see if there is some connection there okay um so what so i i told you that the lois landau uh, level dynamics uh, is related to this metrics action to the non-commutative bosonic field theory uh, from where at the large end limit one can find the bulk edge dynamics, which where uh, uh, gauge invariance is built in in the theory. Uh, we use this uh, index theorem to include the gauge and metric perturbations. And from there, uh, one can calculate response functions um, associated with the non abelian gauge or gravitational fluctuations. I mentioned the, um, the entanglement entropy and the universal formula, which is valid for any dimension and a billion and on a billion background for a new equals one. And uh, one more comment. Now, uh, when the boundary of the entangling surface intersects the edge boundary, uh, so there is an additional log contribution to the entropy and that log that edge contribution to the entropy is proportional to log L where L is the segment that is intersected and C is the central charge of the theory that lives on the edge. So calculating the entropy gives you, a lit, uh, gives you an idea of what is the central charge of the theory on the edge. And uh, Estienne and Stefan and some other people um, indeed um, uh, calculated that and found that C equals one, because remember for it, for a, in two dimensions, the edge degrees of freedom are essentially one dimensional chiral field. But more recently, this was extended to four dimensions uh, when the background field is uh, U1. And the, it would be interesting to see uh, what are the corresponding contributions from non-abelian droplets where one has more uh, interesting um, 
uh, conformal field theories, which is, remember, it's a collection of uh, Vesumino conformal field theories living on the edge. Okay, so with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and... Uh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dimitra, and uh, it's open to questions. Thank you very much. Can I ask a question? Of Please, uh, take care. Yeah, so you showed the universal uh, matrix action, and you said it's, uh, it can be constructed for arbitrary Kähler manifold. Is it, is it correct? You can. Yeah, once you, once you know the single particle spectrum, yes. And uh, on the other hand, as you explained in, in the introduction, quantum Hall effect can be uh, defined on S4, which is not Kähler manifold, right? And uh, can we uh, get some description from your formulation uh, for the quantum Hall effect on S4? I mean, Okay, so so the, the what the work that I showed you uh, is based on CPK manifolds. Mm -hmm. Now I mentioned that the first attempt to uh, extend quantum Hall effect in four dimensions was done on S four mm -hmm. by Hu and Zhang, and they did calculate the uh, uh, spectrum and stuff like that. In fact, there is some connection between S four and what we did by looking at CP3, mm -hmm. uh, but that was a, a different, I think. Yeah, so it's related to the dangerous equation, I think, yeah. Yeah, uh, so the, the, the advantage of CPK is that there is a uniform way to go to higher dimensions um, because that group theory analysis gives you a way to do it for any K. And the Keller structure there is important. Mm -hmm. But it does mean that you cannot do it maybe for other manifolds. I see. I see. Okay, thank you very much. Can I ask a quick question, Dimitra, about the um, universal formula for the entanglement entropy? Um, yes. You you said you use to get the universal formula, you use the volume of phase space. Um, what exactly do you mean by the volume of phase space? Because for a particle on moving in CPK, phase space is 4K dimensional. Um, but CPK itself is a phase space. It has a symplectic structure. And that would be a 2K dimensional phase space. Yeah, uh, so this is this is a 2K dimensional. So so this is the, this is what I mean by phase space. So, uh, oh, so, so you, you're using CPK, CPK itself as a phase space, yeah? Yes. Okay. Exactly. It's kind of a rescaling of the, the metric in CPK. Yeah, so overall, this is the number of degrees of freedom. But D mu, I, norm I, I showed you, I normalized yeah, you it. Yeah, to one, sure, yeah, I understand, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so from there now, I can extract the corresponding phase space area. Thanks. You see, what happens is, of course, Okay, so let me say one thing. Uh, why is the phase space area important? The fact that only the wave functions that are localized around the boundary of the entangling surface contribute to the entropy. Of course, one expects just because of this that the entropy is proportional to area. What the phase space area captures is that what is important, it's not only the area, but how many states are localized around the boundary. That is the extra ingredient that the phase space area captures. How many modes are localized around there is also important. Not just what the boundary is. Thanks. Do we have other questions? Well, maybe, maybe if not, I will stop the recording and we can uh, be less formal. <laughs>